Comstock, Editor-in-Chief of Pharma Forum. I'm here at JP Morgan 2024. Uh, my guest today is Jen Nwanko, CEO of 1910 Genetics. Hey Jen, thanks for talking to me today. Thank you for having me, it's a pleasure. So, uh, first of all, 1910 Genetics, tell me a little bit about the company, um, what you guys do, and um, what, what you're here at the show to talk about, what your news is. Yeah, um, so 1910 Genetics, we are a biotechnology company that's advanced in small and large molecule drug discovery with um, a multimodal AI platform powered by laboratory automation. And so we're a platform company, um, and we design therapeutics for our internal pipeline as well as for external partners. And we've been um, around for five years plus going in um, here at JP Morgan, um, We've got a variety of uh, goals. Uh, we just kicked off our Series B fundraise, um, and we've got some really exciting strategic partnerships that are going to be announced in the coming weeks. So, great. So you're and you said you're and uh, you use AI, but you're also you're developing your own therapeutics. Right. We are fully integrated biotechnology company from the perspective that you know AI is an important tool, but it's just one tool in our tool shed um, on, the, on the quest to develop drugs um, for a variety of diseases across um, neuro, uh, autoimmune, and oncology for both ourselves as well as for our partners. So what do you think about sort of the recent um, boom in AI and then focused on AI as someone who's been in it, you know, for five years, been using this technology right. successfully. And has anything changed? Is it just that it's more crowded with people who maybe don't have the background or the expertise or what are you excited about? Um, 2023 was certainly the year of AI, um, you know, just fooled by ChatGPT, um, which OpenAI and Microsoft launched in November 2022. I think that launch brought AI to the consciousness of the layman, right? Um, people who didn't, who hadn't heard about AI, just, you know, people like my mom, <laughs> and just like, you know, people at the grocery store, you know, had the opportunity to play with um, chat GPT, uh, a consumer facing uh, conversational AI interface. And I think uh, it really captured the imagination and continues to capture the imagination with, um, you know, ability to do a variety of things. And just the idea that there's this sort of like, friend that you've got uh, in the form of chat GPT that you can ask questions and, and get answers to. So I definitely say that um, the release of chat GPT brought AI into the consciousness of the average American. Uh, for those of us who are in what you call a verticalized uh, solution space, which means we are, we're using AI to build solutions for a specific vertical, in this case, be it biotech or pharma, we certainly um, are excited to see, you know, AI in the consciousness of, uh, in the mainstream consciousness. Uh, but for us, you know, not a lot has changed, you know, in terms of both the immense opportunity for AI to um, improve R&D productivity uh, in pharma, which has declined consistently since the 1950s, um, as well as um, the some of the barriers that have prevented AI from from sort of delivering on its uh, potential um, in, in pharma, in biotech. So uh, just excited to see everybody coming off of the ride and um, yeah, just forging ahead with um, trying to bring the potential of this tool and this technology, incredibly powerful technology, bring it to fruition in the form of actual medicines delivered to patients. What are the differentiators now that more and more people, especially in you know, drug development, are, are looking to use this technology how do you stand out and, and what are kind of some of the, uh, you know, what do you lean on to, to make sure that you, you continue to be kind of competitive or, or yeah, in investment dollars or for actual successes or, or what have you? Yeah, so I alluded to AI having incredible potential to reverse decline in R&D productivity. And what I mean by that is um, the, the cost and time of bringing new drugs to market has just continued to increase. Um, and so it, it sort of sets up the stage for technology, particularly AI, to, to help us sort of reverse um, that, that trend. Um, so the opportunity is there, but there are some meaningful barriers around which a company like ours, 1910 Genetics, has developed um, strong modes uh, that give us sort of like a differentiated advantage. Uh, some of these barriers, I'm just gonna talk about a few of them. One is 
just what we call at 1910 a low data regime problem, which is the fact that in biotech and in pharma, we just don't have the, the large scale massive data sets that our tech counterparts have, for example, OpenAI training ChatGPT on the entire internet, like literally the entire English language, right? We don't have that um, breadth and depth of data because the kinds of data sets we have to create require experimentation, right? You have to build a lab, you have to set up the biological assays, you have to run them, and many of these assays are very low throughput, and you're never gonna get the volume of data necessary to take advantage of uh, most of these state-of-the-art AI models. And that's where one of our key differentiators at 1910 comes into play, our very unique data strategy. So we, we've we created uh, three proprietary data streams uh, at 1910. The first is computational um, data, uh, for which we use uh, parallel simulations, whether they be molecular dynamic simulations and uh, quantum mechanics simulations to sort of model um, you know, biological phenomena and simulate biological phenomena, um, you know, uh, using computation. And from there, we create just massive uh, uh, computational data, which we uh, use in concert with two additional data types, um, one which we call wet lab proxy biological data. And what this means is that in the wet lab, using our robotics enabled automation, we um, create surrogate assays that are able to scale um, in ways that uh, gold standard biological assays cannot. And again, from that um, uh, uh, avenue, we generate very massive uh, data sets uh, in the wet lab. And then finally, the third data type that we created at 1910 is indeed the ground truth or the gold standard biological assays that are inherently low throughput in nature, but when we combine them with the computational data stream and the wet lab proxy biological data stream in concert, we then have like this massive volume of data um, that enables us to take advantage of state-of-the-art AI models where we wouldn't have been able to do that if we just relied solely on the traditional uh, gold standard biological assays. So our data strategy is a core differentiator. I'd say the second one is um, our, our robotics enabled laboratory automation. Uh, we, we spent a good uh, chunk of our Series A proceeds over an 18 month period building a state of the art um, lab facility in the Boston Seaport District. And what that's allowed us to do is to put the data and the machine learning and the biology in the loop, uh, in an iterative loop um, uh, that allows them to reinforce one another and, 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 and guide us towards iterative um, design. And perhaps maybe the third differentiator I'd allude to is the fact that not only do we have, do we build multimodal AI, which is essentially AI models that consume and ingest different modalities of data, whether they be computational or biological, genomic, proteomic, transcriptomic, etc. Uh, we also, on the output side, are able to uh, design um, different therapeutic modalities. So we started out uh, primarily uh, designing small molecules, but today we're designing everything from peptides to monoclonal antibodies, fabs, VHHs, antibody drug conjugates, and so on. So I'd say again to recap, three differentiators around our data strategy and the way we, we overcome the low data regime problem in biotech. Secondly, our robotics enabled laboratory automation, and third being uh, the modality uh, agnostic uh, therapeutics that we can create with the platform. So when you're sort of changing the game in these ways, you're you know you're you're changing the traditional data strategy, you're introducing these robotics. What? How do you deal with regulators and making sure that you know they have trust in what you're doing and, and all of your kind of models are approved? I mean, does that has that slowed you down? Has um, you know is that an issue? Um, you know, you healthcare and life sciences in particular is a heavily regulated. Um, industry um, and you encounter regulators at different stages of the um, drug discovery and development value chain. For us, we're, our first contact um, or encounter with regulators would be with the FDA when we go on to file for IMD approval, which is the first time you actually go to the FDA and ask for approval to begin human testing of a preclinical therapeutic. I think from my understanding at this point, the FDA has primarily focused on, um, regardless of the tool set that you use to generate the data, 
the FDA is fundamentally wondering, is the small goal, regardless of modality, is it safe? That's the first question the FDA wants to know. Is it safe? Do you have robust evidence of safety across a variety of preclinical models? And so I'm talking about you know, rodents and, and large animals and so on. Um, have you satisfied the burden of proof that this is safe? And then secondly, um, is there, uh, speaking to potential efficacy, is there the potential that um, this would be efficacious? Um, as, as, as sort of alluded to by, um, you know, just robust biological evidence connecting the underlying biology to the disease. I think the FDA has focused really on those two questions, and I think regardless of whether you use AI or traditional methodology to arrive at your uh, preclinical um, IND candidate, you're going to have to satisfy the burden of proof um, on those two dimensions. Now, for certain companies for whom an AI model is the product, that's a little bit of a different scenario where the model itself, so for companies perhaps in the digital health space where they are deploying models to, you know, remind patients to take their prescription medicines or fundamentally to um, provide some sort of clinical, uh, clinician de decision support, I think those models require a different regulatory approval pathway where our models at this point, we're not releasing into the public domain and asking people to make, um, you know, potentially consequential decisions based on recommendations from those models. We are, um, people are going to interact at this point in time with uh, our products in the form of therapeutics and, and, and more and more, and by people I mean consumers. Now enterprises and like big pharma companies and big technology companies with whom we are partnering will increasingly interact with our, our products in the form of models and data. And so we're going to continue to think about our our sort of regulatory strategy uh, as a function of what products we're putting out there. So if that makes sense, when you put out therapeutics, you sort of have to think about therapeutic, um, you know, burdens of proof. And when you put out models and software products, you're going to have to think about the regulatory hurdles there. But they're, they're, they're different. Um, and so that's sort of, we, it's an evolving, um, you know, thought process for us and just driven by what products are we putting in the hands of people. So at this show, obviously, a, a lot of energy is, goes into kind of prognosticating trends, thinking about what's, what we're going to see coming up this year, what are we looking for. Um, what, are kind of, what are some of your thoughts about um, what's coming up in, in 2024, whether it's on the business side of right. a therapeutic company or you know, some of the things that are exciting in the R&D world? Um, I mean, it's what's today, January eighth. I mean, we've this has already been a it's been it's already been a flurry of deals uh, being announced. There's so much activity. I mean, literally starting from the last week of Christmas, uh, it just felt like there was like just this explosion of activity in biotech. So for me, I'm excited to see you know renewed uh, enthusiasm by big pharma companies and striking deals of different kinds and and just you know um, continuing that very important ecosystem of externalizing um, technology assets candidates from biotech into pharma so there's just been just intense activity in the past two weeks and so if that is you know sort of um, if that is a, a foreshadows what's coming this year then I think this year will be characterized by uh, a lot of uh, very um, exciting deal making between pharma between um, uh, biotech. I think what my my sort of prediction would be that would see um, more and more uh, collision between more traditional big tech uh, and pharma in, in, in biotech, uh, perhaps in ways that are, are not super obvious to a lot of people. I think uh, towards the end of 23, we started to see, um, you know, big tech companies like NVIDIA partner with, um, you know, Genentech on, you know, AI driven discovery. And then we saw IBM, which hasn't been active in the space for, for a minute since sort of the sunsetting of IBM Watson Health. You saw sort of IBM sort of have new life breathing into them in the form of a partnership with Boringo Engelheim. I think uh, there's going to be many such um, sort of partnerships. And I think um, uh, we, we're excited about the role that 1910 would, would play um, in that intersection of big tech and biotech this year. Uh, beyond that, I think uh, 2024 is going to be a bit of a watershed moment for AI drug discovery. You know, there are quite a few, um, you know, generation one uh, AI companies. They've got um, clinical stage 
uh, readouts coming out this year, uh, particularly phase two efficacy trials. I think um, just really hoping and praying that those turn out positive because I think it continues to be important validation of, of the importance of the technology. But regardless of the outcome, I think one way or the other, the readouts of those clinical studies will be important. I do think the IPO market will start to um, see uh, new life um, for, for biotechs. I think we already saw you know, a, a couple of preclinical IPOs um, get, get set to hit the public market. Um, preclinical IPOs, you know, a, a bit of a provocative topic. Some people don't really think preclinical companies should be going public, but regardless of what your sort of ideological sentiments are, it just the, the, the idea um, that there is indeed a path to the public market for, for biotech companies is something to be on the watch out for. So lots of excitement. I think that um, sort of the doom and gloom that characterized much of 2023 from a, a financing environment, even from a deal-making environment early in the year in biotech, I think much of that will, will start to see a positive turn. That's at least my expectation in 24. Well, that's great news. I hope you're right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I hope I'm right too. <laughs> Any final thoughts? Um, I'm just excited. Uh, it's, it hasn't rained yet, uh, the three days I've been here, um, and just really looking forward to um, the opportunity for us as an industry to continue to leverage technology um, on this very, very incredibly challenging quest of drug discovery and development. And I think really to, to start to bend this um, this curve uh, and make uh, R&D a bit more sustainable from a productivity perspective. So I hope that this is a year that we start to make a positive uh, turn in, in declining R&D productivity. And I'm looking forward to the role that LinkedIn 10 Genetics will play in helping to turn that around. Thank you so much, Jen. Really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. Have a great show. Thank you.